Hello and welcome to this very special, special series of podcasts and YouTube videos that we are doing to take, going to take place during Creation Tide. I'm joined by Father Neil Hook from Haverford West and Reverend Marcus Zippelin from Langham, uh, both of whom are on the Diocesan Creation Care Action Group. And over the next six weeks, we will be putting together short 20-minute videos um, and podcasts to help you make the most of your Creation Tide experience this year. So I'm going to ask Father Neil and Father Marcus some questions. The first question is, what is Creation Tide? I think the easiest way to decide Creation Tide is it's the, church, it's the newest part of the church's calendar. Just like the, we have the season of Advent and the season of Christmas, we have the season of Lent and Pentecost. Now we have this new season, sometimes called the season of creation, sometimes called creation tide. It runs from the 1st of September to the 4th of October. And sometimes it has four Sundays in it, and sometimes it has five Sundays in it, depending on the year. But it runs from the beginning of September until the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi on the 4th of October. And it gives us a chance as a church, individually and corporately, to reflect upon our responsibilities, our care for creation, and to pray our way through the issues that are facing God's creation right at this time. Yeah, you're right, Neil, it's a, a, about it being the, the newest um, season. I mean, it's been around a little while, perhaps we'll, we might explain its his, history later, but it, it is quite new because it's, it's not even featuring in our election, is it? You can't see it there. You know, you have to go online to sort of see evidence of it, but it's pretty widespread around the world um, and quite well, well adopted in the Anglican church, church as well. And uh, as you, you talked about running through September into October, um, which kind of, it hinges around finishing really, doesn't it, with the patron saint of ecology in the Catholic Church, St. Francis, which is a very good, um, a good feast to include. But also, of course, that runs through what would be our harvest time as well. And so it gives us the opportunity to sort of incorporate that celebration and give it, give it I think, um, its place within the wider sense of caring for God's creation, giving thanks for God's creation and, and gifts as well. Gives us a, a new sort of dimension to our harvest celebrations, which can sometimes be a little bit um, uh, anachronistic, I think, and we sort of wonder what to do with them. But now within the context of creation care, um, I think it will give it a new life. Yeah, it started in the, with our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Patriarch Demetrius I um, announced that the Orthodox Church was going to have um, a season of creation in 1989, all the way back then. And gradually it spread around the churches. Uh, in 2015, Pope Francis um, adopted it for the Roman Catholic Church. But really, it got its major kickoff in 2007 and 2008, uh, when it went to the Ecumenical Assemblies um, and to the World Council of Churches in 2008. And it was adopted by the World Council of Churches, which means churches of every denomination and flavour and background um, got behind this idea of having a season of creation. Um, the Anglican Church, some areas of the Anglican Church have really gone uh, very well into this. Um, the Church in Wales, we've been just a little bit slower. Um, as Marcus says, it doesn't quite appear in our lectionary yet. But the first set of resources for Creation Tide were produced by the Diocese of Bangor mm. in 2017. Uh, so that's three years ago. Um, so it, it has been um, it has been hanging around for a little while now. Yeah, I mean, hopefully that as yeah, resources you mentioned, we can um, signpost people to those on, on our website yeah, um, for the season. Absolutely. Why is it important that you, do you think that the church celebrates and embraces Creation Tide? Well, it's a, I mean, uh, di different different levels. I mean, what one is the pressing sort of need that we know just in the world at large from, um, for, uh, to deal with the climate crisis that we find ourselves in and the sort of extinction crisis that we face 
you know, we're sort of very, very aware of that and beginning to sort of mainstream that awareness into our lives. And so the church sits within that, that world as well, um, needing to sort of to um, look after our, our common home. But of course, then we come up from a different angle, recognizing that our common home is also God's gift and uh, God's creation. That's, you know, we can use that term rather than just talking about the environment in, in a sort of neutral sense. But I guess what it's interesting, really, when you when you realize those pressures that are coming from, from the world and they're sort of speaking to us, isn't it? Groaning out in travail, as Paul writes it, wanting us to sort of play our part and caring for it. And then you look at the scriptures, you begin to see gosh, that thread runs deeply through them and it's something we sort of ignore um, or sideline probably for, you know, for, for well, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of, of years. And it's a bit, it's, it's actually quite a joy, I think, to rediscover in, in, the, in, in scripture, in the Bible, the sort of environmental, the creation care environmental side of our um, discipleship and service as, as Christians. And I found it's affirmed my faith actually to have, um, to realise that the Bible speaks so strongly to the contemporary issues of our time and, and actually we can mine scripture for all sorts of insight and help um, uh, a, a, along the way. And so um, we should care because God calls us to care and perhaps we might explore that in some of our talks, you know, the theology behind it. But it's also um, a delight um, to discover that actually our faith and our, our scriptures give us resources to do so. I think for me as well, Sophie, the last couple of years have seen a real public outcry. We've seen Extinction Rebellion on the streets. Um, we have seen them uh, taking forms of direct action, gluing themselves to buses and to um, trains and um, chaining themselves to railings in acts of public protest. And I realise that the current generation, uh, our younger people, are quite wary of institutional forms of Christianity. I mean, there are reasons for that. The scandals of the institutional church, the larger distrust of institutions, the failure of the churches to proclaim the gospel authentically or clearly. But I think one of the main reasons is that we as uh, the Christian church have failed to grapple clearly and consistently with climate change. And it's that which I think can also help us to reach out to a whole generation of unchurched and de-churched people. We are at an extinction level event. That's, that's what's coming up. We're talking about mass extinction of animals possibly including ourselves just because of our own rapacious hunger for consuming the planet um, and creating these urban built environments which dominate the face of the earth and also the mass transit the boats and the trains and the airplanes and the cars that are not only belching pollutants into the atmosphere, but as we've learnt from the spread of coronavirus, allows for the easy transmission of pandemic level events. What we're talking about here is not just an issue, it is the issue facing humanity, full stop. It trumps all others. And therefore, the Christian faith is going to have to grapple with this issue. And as a church, one of the ways that we start to think about issues is through our liturgy. It's through our Sunday services. It's through our hymns. It's through listening to scripture being broken apart by a succession of speakers. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, each year there is a theme um, around Creation Died and this year our theme is Jubilee for the Earth. Can you, can you give us a little bit more information about this year's theme? Well, I mean, 
jubilee i think it literally it means like a trumpet doesn't it from the the trumpet or a, bla a horn that was blown um uh, to inaugurate the jubilee and you find it described in leviticus 25 and it's a rather remarkable chapter in in the old testament whereby after seven times seven years in the 49th year you're supposed to declare a, a year of jubilee where all of the land would rest um and um just be allowed to, to be itself debts were forgiven people were returned to their homeland slaves uh, were freed and uh, it was a year where we didn't try to thrash as much productivity out of the earth as we can and we just uh, enjoyed it you know in, in a sort of prolonged sabbath day for, for, for a sabbath year so it's a, a timely um a timely theme and uh, this, this theme was picked before 2020 started and then we had the coronavirus crisis and we had that month that that six weeks at the beginning in march or april where it seemed as if europe was on lockdown and nobody was going out and you were getting news stories of dolphins returning to the waters of venice mm -hmm. because the canals had within a fortnight cleared themselves of pollutants of wild animals coming and grazing on people's front gardens and it was literally like the jubilee had become incarnate yeah no you're right i mean that was a striking feature wasn't it the early parts of lockdown and one of the delights of it even though it was a difficult time was when people were taking seriously that sense of you only come out for one hour for a bit of exercise and really delighting in creation because of the quietness wasn't it and the, the lack of cars and because the animals have crept back into our urban urban spaces and you could see really you know you got a real strong sense of um of a sabbath feeling wasn't it delighting in what god had made and uh and rejoicing in it and, and, and in a way that i think people long to do sometimes but our busy lives crowd it out scripture talks about uh, particularly the Old Testament, about um, agricultural festivals in the Old Testament, a season of harvests. But when the, um, the trumpet was blown, when the Jubilee was blown, control, which is what humanity had tried to have over the land, was given up for a year. Control was given back to God. And I think that's what the corona crisis and the season of creation coming together has uh, allowed us to do. Um, yes, it's uncomfortable when we lose control and when we're told that we have to stay inside um, and we, we lose that, that freedom, as it were. But at the same time, by denying ourselves some of that freedom to exploit, some of that freedom to um, control. We give freedom back to all of God's creation, to all of our brothers and our sisters, to all things that crawl and swim and fly and walk upon the earth. Mm. Yeah, give, give them back control, give them back that they're created sort of ordinance really to, to to worship and praise god in their own right you know i mean psalm 19 which talks about creation kind of communicating with itself and sort of pra praising praising god and of course creation communicating god's presence to us you know as, as we find in romans chapter one i think it is and uh but you know we, if we don't give creation its space to do that we miss out uh, on that dimension of interaction with god and Communication, you know. God I mean, the, 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 Ang the Anglican Communion adopted five marks of mission. Mm. And the fifth mark of mission um, is to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. I mean, it's, it's one of those key fundamental principles. Um, and so... There are things that we can do in the season of creation, not just as a church, 
but individually there are things that we can do to make a difference and every little thing does make a difference we've seen that with the reduction in transport over the last six months and the millions of tons of carbon that um, have been saved from being uh, exhausted into the atmosphere. Thank you, both of you. Um, so one question I would like to ask you both. Uh, over the last few months, we've all struggled with how we find the new normal. We've been struggling quite a lot with coronavirus and how that's affecting our church lives, our ministry, etc., etc. So the idea of bringing up Creation Tide at this time is probably for some a little overwhelming. Mm, yeah. So what would you say is the one thing a minister or a member, a lay person or, or anybody really can do at this time, this, during this time of creation tide, what is the one thing that they can do to begin to make a difference? Well, <laughs> I, I thought, I thought of like a couple of things. One as an individual and one perhaps as a part of the church. And I mean, as an individual person, if you're at the beginning of, thinking about care for creation as part of your discipleship, then go for a walk outside and say your prayers outside, I think. Just, just commit to doing that, you know, even just once in this season. Let God speak to you. Thank God for everything he gives you, including creation. And maybe just pray that you would be moved to care for it as God does. So just take a walk uh, outside. That would be one, one thing. But if you're a bit more, you like a bit more of an action plan or if, from a church perspective, then um, I would say uh, engage with Eco Church, you know, which is the, the way that we're structuring our response to care for creation within the diocese and the church in Wales. And um, there's the resources on, on the website. Yeah, you can start very softly with that, but it just gives you a bit of a pathway to care for creation. Thanks, Pastor. Sometimes it helps to do practical things. So when Marcus says go on a walk, um, take a plastic bag with you and if you see some rubbish, yeah. pick it up. If you go into the supermarket that day and you have a choice between buying fair trade bananas and normal bananas, then why fair trade bananas that day? Um, if you are doing some work in the garden, uh, remember that the bees are a fantastic pollinator. So think about um, planting some flowers that maybe would help the, uh, the bees. Um, if you think about the disposable plastics um, that uh, we are putting into the environment um, and you're going to buy some apples, get them in a brown paper bag, all the sorts of things. Um, but don't try and do too much. Just maybe set yourself one little thing each day, which maybe you're going to um, try to do during the creation season. Um, and if you need some help, um, we can post the link um, to the shrinkingthefootprint.org, which has uh, a calendar for you with suggestions for things that you can do um, every day during the season of creation. It's kind of like a, a, an advent calendar, but, but for creation. That's what I had to Thank you. I will put at the end of this video a list of links to various websites, etc., as well. So you can catch up with uh, all that's going on in the diocese and across the country, actually. Uh, and the, the hashtag for ha is hashtag seasons of creation. But I will pop a link up to those at the end of the video. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Uh, we will be back next Thursday um, through and every Thursday through Creation Tide with ideas, resources, and more conversation between Reverend Marcus and Father Neil. Um, you can subscribe or catch up via the podcast on the Sackcloth and po Coffee podcast, and there will be various links, as I said, later on in the video. Thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.